So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bogenstein. I'm interim director of the Center for uh, Jewish Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life. Um, can you hear me in the back? Is that, yes. There's no microphone here, so I guess we'll have to project. Um, welcome uh, to the screening of the film Denial and uh, our commemoration of uh, Kristana. 79 years ago, on November 9th and 10th, 1938, the German government organized the systematic destruction of Jewish houses of worship and community centers throughout Germany and Austria. <coughs> Shops <coughs> and businesses of Jewish owners were destroyed and looted. Countless German Jews were beaten, many to death, beaten to death, women raped, and about 30,000 Jewish men arrested and deported to concentration camps. The attacks were perpetrated by the SA, the SS, and the Gestapo, but not exclusively by those notorious units. They were carried out also by local police in collaboration with firefighters who were instructed to keep the flames of the burning synagogues from reaching the property of the non-Jewish neighbors. All of this would not have been possible without the open or implicit consent of the majority of the German and Austrian population who stood by and watched as these crimes against humanity were committed and the genocide unfolded. We commemorate the, victim, commemorate the victims of the pogrom and the Holocaust today in the context of our campus-wide metanoia under the title Confronting Racism Together. It is especially important in our troubling times when racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination are again gaining unexpected popularity and currency in the public <coughs> sphere, that we need to stand up and speak up wherever we encounter them. What happened in Germany 79 years ago is a reminder for us today to make our voices heard before they are silenced, whether we're directly affected by the discrimination or not. There's a famous quote by Martin Niemöller, a Protestant theologian and member of the resistance against the Nazis that I find especially timely. Um, he said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. So. We have the privilege today that we're joined by Professor Hans Laufer, who kindly agreed to talk to us about his memory of Kristallnacht and how he experienced the pogrom and its aftermath. Hans Laufer has been Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology at UConn since 1965. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 1959 and had a postdoctoral scholarship from the National Research Council. His research foci include comparative endocrinology of invertebrates and the development of crustacean aquaculture techniques. He has close to 200 publications, or perhaps even more now, a sample of which you can find on his website. I won't even begin to list any of them here. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lauper. Well, I was, I was eight, nine years old uh, when Kristallnacht occurred. And I remember it vividly because it made a huge difference in my life. Uh, I was living in Greenberg in Schlesien, Silesia, a small town uh, which is now uh, in Poland, you know, in the border. Uh, um, what I remember most, well, I was awakened during the middle of the night at 2 a.m. in the morning at Kristona when a washer plunger, they didn't in those days have washing machines, so they had washer plungers uh, to help with the, with the laundry. And I recognized the plunger as something that probably came from the dry goods store down the street, which belonged to a Jew. And it surely did, because we next morning saw that dry goods store, and it was an unbelievable wreck. But what was interesting to me 
was that the breaking of the, my bedroom window in my home was the only wreck that we experienced. And I think that there are several reasons, I think, for that. My father was a very well-known businessman in town, and he ran a business, and he had a lot of contacts, and he donated the, the soccer ball field to the town of the Kuhnberg. <coughs> and so I think that while they wrecked many Jewish stores in town, and they burned the temple, we saw that the same day, but the other consequences that I experienced was that was my last day, the day before was my last day of public school. I was in third grade. And the other thing that happened is I also had violin lessons. Violin lessons and they stopped. And my Hebrew lessons, I had a tutor that came to my house once a week and he couldn't come. But the other thing that happened after Kristallnacht left, my father, would, well, they said this was a public popular uprising uh, and involved the public. And as I said, the synagogue was burned down and, and a lot of other things happened. But my father was arrested that day and he had to report to the police for at least another 10 or 15 days. And then he was put in the concentration camp. So the, the, the concentration camp was Jacksonhausen, which is south of Berlin. Uh, it didn't stick. Fortunately, he had spent uh, some weeks in the summer uh, coming to the United States to arrange legal immigration. And he had made contacts and had people sign for him. My uncle also was in the United States and job. But interestingly enough, my uncle got his PhD in 1934 at the University of Berlin in, phys uh, in, in physics and engineering. And the first thing that happened to him is one of his, this was in 34, this was in 33. So one of the professors refused to sign for him uh, in first PhD, but another professor stepped up and signed for him. But he couldn't get in 34, but he couldn't get a job, an important job. So he had to leave. He left for England, and the job only lasted one year. So he, had, he was employed by CBS in New York, and then he was uh, 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 hold here for future uh, immigration. So I think that these events happened to help us. Uh, my father was in, in a concentration camp in, until about February, and we left the country when he signed away all of his property, which was a lot. Uh, we had a lot of property and several manufacturing facilities. Anyway, we came here <clears throat> March of third, uh, March three, and went into New York. We took, uh, we, we left Germany through uh, Holland and England, and left on the Aquitania in South Co uh, uh, South Southampton uh, to come to New York. We landed in New York, and uh, I went to public school good public school in New York. We came to New York, by the way, with $16, which is what my father was allowed to take, $4 per person. The rest of it, the family riches, and there were many properties in the factory left behind, had to be signed away, and the restitution is still awaiting because Poland hasn't made good on German property taken. Anyway, uh, we landed in New York. I went to uh, elementary school and public school and Stuyvesant High School and City College. And in those days, there were ex excellent schools. And I got a good education and got a PhD. And so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the, uh, 
Germans said that the burning of the synagogues was a popular uprising, contrary to what was just said earlier. But, uh, and I know it was not a popular uprising because years later I went to a museum in Prague and they had a collection of temple, the, the Torah, uh, Torah uh, curtains from the temples. They were all stolen and accumulated. And so I think what they, before they burned all of the synagogues, they must have been raided and emptied of all their valuables. And the stuff was collected then. Some of it appeared in, now in the museums more recently. So uh, it was not a popular uprising, but it was certainly a, a thorough uprising because all the Jewish stores and all the Jewish temples were destroyed. Institutions versus Germany, uh, for instance. But I, I didn't understand your question. Like, uh, why was Poland uh, difficult in providing restitutions as well? They to took the property from Germany, as I guess, as a result of the war, being occupied by by Germany, and they got liberated, and they took it as a war prize, I guess. So the Poles did not want uh, the Jews. They still owe people a lot of money, <laughs> but they're not doing it all. Does it question all the way back? Did you ever consider going back? What? Did you ever consider going back after I've the war? Back. I went back once to see my pride of my former home. By the way, I have a picture of it in my pocket, but it's not a here. Anybody wants to see it? I was looking for other pictures. I've been back. Uh, and, uh, interestingly enough, there was a warehouse. My father had a big business. He had a warehouse, and he also had a, uh, 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 a horse. He had a, a horse stable, and both the horse stable <coughs> and the warehouse were turned into into apartment property by the Polish people who were living there. Put it up here in the, in the portfolio. 
way well. Mm -hmm. It's a five-story building, and our business was on the first floor. And it was not attacked, whereas the Germans and a Jewish store down the street, on the same street, was destroyed. So we can see it actually here on the... Second floor was the Laufer residence, and then the other floors were our right apartment. Uh, Which one? The window was yours. It was in the back. It was in the back. Well, thank you very much again for sharing uh, this experience with us. Okay, sound wise, you're talking.